while my brothers Robert and John and I were at prep school, our parents lived abroad. So we always had to spend our holidays with relatives. Our favourite uncle and aunt had bought a farmhouse on the outlying land of an old manor house of which the estate was being broken up. The main house, Abbey Manor, was being allowed to fall down in its own good time, while the owner, Sir Roger, lived in a small dower house in the park. The cottage which Uncle Tom and Aunt Catherine had bought had also been empty for a long time. You know, there, there were nettles growing up to the front door and even between the flagstones in the larder. But it had been well built. You know, there, there, there were stone mullions, leaded windows, tiled floors. And perhaps because of its isolation, it, it had escaped the, the wanton smashing up that is the fate of many empty houses. A, a profound silence brooded over it, I remember, and the acres that went with it. My aunt had a passion for gardening, and there was much to be done before this weed-infested land could be disciplined to her intentions. But you see, the wildness was a paradise for us children, and walks in the adjacent park were among the chief excitement of our visits. There was the empty manor itself, of course, with its staring windows and lost melancholy garden, its weedy paths leading to locked gates. We had Sir Roger's permission to wander there, but we never climbed the gate without a thrill or chill of expectation. One wing of the 15th century manor had been built over the former abbey graveyard, and, and here and there in the grounds, lying among the rhododendrons, were the empty stone coffins of forgotten abbots. They were, they were grand things, these, hand-hewn from solid blocks of local stone and hollowed to the austerest outline of the human body with a round resting place with a head. We, 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 we'd walk past them with great awe, but also with a, a kind of affection as noble things treated with contempt and now part of our own private landscape. There was a lake reflecting the house and the stables and the stables themselves, which were dusty, echoing and forlorn. Now, Uncle Tom used to sigh over all this decay, but his wife had an eye open for everything that could be moved, bought or made use of, you know, the, a small wrought iron gate, a sundial. And even in one ambitious moment, as we all stood looking up at it, the little bell tower on the stables its four open arches and lead dome had the beauty of extreme simplicity against the, the pale green sky. Well, why should it rot there, said Auntie? It would suit our yard just as well. But you see, the yard, which is surrounded by fine old barns, was Uncle's special domain, and he resisted any intrusion. No, 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 he said. No, it, it's sure to be rotten. On our first visit to the farmhouse, Aunt Catherine had been busy making a wild garden out of an acre or two of heather and stone. I mean, it was boggy in places, and we helped to make the watercourses for her while she laid stepping stones and contrived rough slab bridges. There was a high mound in the middle of this patch, apparently artificial, although of some age, judging by the hawthorn tree that grew on top of it, and it was crowned by a large boulder now, in the course of her construction, Aunt Catherine found that she needed soil to raise the beds above the level of the surrounding damp. And one day she decided that she would shift the top of this hillock. Well, I mean, we children responded with delight to her invitation to see if we could roll the boulder off. But all our efforts were in vain. In the end, it took a whole team of us under the personal command of Uncle himself to dislodge it with levers. But at last, the, the slope took possession of it and it rolled on a, a clumsy and fortuitous course and came to rest at the edge of one of our little boggy streams. And when we next came to stay, Aunt Catherine's heather garden was already taking good shape. She, she'd preserved the, the wild atmosphere perfectly and the hillock was down almost to the level of the rest. And look, boys, look at this, she said as she showed us round. We struck on this yesterday. She pointed to the, the top of a trough, I suppose a coffer of stone, which her digging had left half uncovered. The slab over it that had served as a lid had been prized up 
and now rested sideways upon it, leaving a gaping hole through which the loose earth on top had poured in. Aunt Catherine stopped with a gasp. Huh? When did you open it? She asked Uncle. What? Well, I haven't touched it, my dear. Well, then, who's been here? And why? I mean, look at it. Why would anyone want to move that? Aunt Cathy laughed uneasily and said that she'd guessed that whatever was once in was now out, unless it was just old bones, of course, and in that case, she wasn't going to bother disturbing them. Old bones, said my brother Robert, but no, it, it's not the right shape for a coffin, auntie. It's not like the Abbots. Look, there's no place for the head. Perhaps it was a criminal who'd been beheaded. Or perhaps an animal thing, suggested John. But hey, hey, look, there are words on it, said Robert, who'd been gingerly shoveling off the clay that clung to the lid. And then we all got busy with penknives, trowel and sticks to clean away the letters. Libera nos quaesimus domine ab malo, it said. Um, my brothers and I shrank away from the Latin, but luckily Uncle Tom translated it for us. Deliver us, O Lord, from the evil one. Ooh, I'm not sure I like that, said Aunt Catherine, but then she shrugged. But I'm short of a slab for my stepping stones, and this will do me very well. Come on, boys, all lift now. And so the the slab took its place face downward in one of the paths, while the coffin itself was very skillfully planted with bushes of rosemary and Spanish gorse and trailing rock roses. By the time that the, the story I'm telling you now really begins, it had a natural and undisturbed appearance. And, and around the wild garden that it dominated, the, the lapwings and the wagtails had quite made themselves at home. It was at the, the beginning of the long summer holidays. Aunt Catherine, having completed one plan, was now looking for something new and the suggestion of moving the old bell tower from the manor stables was once more raised. So we set off with Uncle Tom one afternoon to examine it. Now, the old stables surrounded three sides of a large courtyard, and they were in an atrocious condition. The, the once beautiful and elaborate coach house let in the rain through a large hole in the roof, while the, the loose boxes were crumbling with dry rot. Our, our footsteps and voices echoed inside as we made our tour of inspection. And then we mounted the ladder to the lofts, and spiders and rats were clearly the only things that moved there now. Uncle Tom was the, the first to go up the second ladder and thrust his body as far as the knees into the little cupola, while Robert and John were jostling on the lower rungs, their heads level with the opening. I was left alone on a little square landing. On one side of me was the ladder. On the other three were doors opening into dark lofts. Now, we'd already explored these, and we had found them to be perfectly empty. So I was very alarmed to suddenly hear a hoarse burst of laughter, like a horse's cough, coming from one of them. I tugged at my brothers, and they came down the ladder, and Uncle too, who'd finished his measuring and tapping in the bell tower. I told them that I thought there was somebody in one of the lofts. I, I, I'd heard him coughing. So we all went round again, and I took care to be neither first nor last in or out of any of the rooms. But, of course, we saw nothing, and I was mercilessly teased on the way home. At supper that night, Auntie was told all about it. The, the measurements of the bell tower were very suitable, Uncle Tom told her, and the, the condition wasn't bad either. But, but the bell's missing, he said. You, you get a splendid view of our place from the roof, by the way, Catherine. Yeah, I could see your bad man's coffin quite plainly. And there's the chap who heard him too, he added, pointing his fork at me. Made us all feel quite queer, didn't you? Anyway, I'll go and see Sir Roger tomorrow. I, I'm sure that he'll sell it. I, I rather like the idea of having a, a bit of the old house here, I must say. Yes, well, don't you bring anything too old over from the manor house, I said Aunt Catherine. Leave the ghost behind at any rate. A bit late to warn me about that now, dear. It was you who took the lid off the bad man's coffin, yet it was open already, as you perfectly well know. Well, who rolled the boulder away that was supposed to keep him down? Hey, boys. Hmm? Again, he 
he pointed at us with his fork and leered. And again, we, we grinned, of course, but we, we shuddered slightly too. The next day, Sir Roger happened to pass our gate and he stopped to speak to us. Ah, well, you're digging yourselves in very nicely here, I must say, he said to Uncle. Yeah, all looks very jolly. <laughs> well done, you. Of course, I've, I've no choice but to sell what I can, but the, these gimcrack buildings do gall me, I must say. Now, the, this was a good opening, and before long, bargaining for the bell tower had begun. It ended in Uncle's favour, because at the last moment, he brought out his trump card. There was no bell. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that, that, that's true, said Sir Roger. But in fact, the, the, the big no bell is one of its greatest attractions, if you ask me. There's an old legend, you see. Oh, yeah. It was called the Judas Bell, apparently, that bell. Although where it originally came from and who betrayed who, I think the foggiest. It was the old curfew. Yeah, and of course, if people are out when they ought to be in, then things are likely to happen to them. The old people around here said that the, the bell had a familiar. The last person who rang it was, was my great-grandfather. He, he did it for a wager, and, well... It's a fact that rather shortly afterwards he was he was found dead, <laughs> rather horribly dead actually. And after that, you see, the bell was taken down and destroyed. Well, I'm sorry for your your grandfather, but you you can't expect me to pay for a legend about a bell that no longer exists," said Uncle Tom. And the bargain was settled at a a very small figure. And before the end of those holidays, the the graceful little bell tower was set up in the middle of the building in our stable yard. It was repainted to, to match its new position, and it, it looked very well there. Aunt and uncle were both extremely pleased with it, I remember. But wet weather had set in, and we'd grown tired of indoor games. So when Robert said that he'd like to go and fish in the Manor Brook, we followed him out happily with rods, nets, and jam jars full of worms. We had to cross the wild garden, which I must say, since Uncle's jokes had begun to stir rather sinister feelings in us. The, the lapwings cried and veered and flung themselves along the wind. The, the thin rain pattered in little brown streams and the wagtails looked sharply at us and ran hither and thither as though disguising their real activities. We, we began to run and shooed them away as if they were unwanted thoughts. But as we paused halfway across the stile into the park and looked back, there they were, as before, and the curlews sounded derisive as if we had no business to be out there. The little stream through the park had invaded the grass at its edge beyond the cast of Thomas's fishing rod, and the, the lake into which it flowed had swollen too. Even the cinder road that led to the manor farm was underwater, and the farmer was already there with Sir Roger, complaining that the outlet sluice was blocked and had, had never been mended, and the lake itself was silting up and so full of weeds that you couldn't tell where it began and where it ended. Sir Roger listened with a, a rather pained expression, and he promised to have it seen to as soon as the, the flood subsided enough. As for us, we, we spent the afternoon happily testing the depth of every outflow, and we returned home wet to the skin. A week later, dredging operations began on the lake. The sluice was opened, and the water sank down to mud level. The weeds were cut down, and a band of old men in waders were wheeling the smelly, fibrous mud in barrows along planks. We were there to watch all this, of course, and much came to light. There was a sunken boat, a scythe blade, a weather vane, a skull, and most surprising of all, a bell. Uh, it was a strange-shaped thing, thickly covered with sharp flakes of rust, and the, the pivot of its tongue was rusted solid, so it, it couldn't swing. That'll be the old Judas bell, right enough, said one old man. Didn't I hear a tell that your uncle had bought the old bell tower? That's an odd thing to buy. I'd like to hear what my old woman would say if I'd come back one day and say that I'd bought her a bell tower. Well, we ran off to announce the find at home excitedly, and Uncle Tom at once called for Sir Roger and took him along to see it. Our uncle, yeah, yeah, he had a flair for antiques, and this interested him a good deal. He, he was keen to reunite it with a little tower that was now in our courtyard. I mean, Sir Roger simply shook his head. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I can hardly ask you for any money for a thing like that, can I? <laughs> Look at the rust on it. <laughs> no, no, I can give you. You do what you like with it. I, I'm not superstitious, but I, I wouldn't touch it myself. Well, the, the bell was sent away to be cleaned and repaired. But even in its absence, we, well, the children at least, I know, had a prickly feeling of foreboding. I, I, I remember the, the golden September weather, the, the scent of southern wood and lavender and the, the yellow leaves spotted with black that were beginning to fall. But now for us, the garden had somehow become haunted. We no longer basked in it quite at our ease, or felt that the earth and fields, the trees and sky were all our own. That there were darker corners where we definitely did not go to now, and where in our games nobody thought of hiding or seeking. It was on the, the last morning of the holidays that the bell came back. It was delivered by van, wrapped in sacking, with its now mobile tongue thickly wedged and muffled in felt. We all gathered round while, while Uncle unwrapped it, and seeing us so deeply interested, he, he made quite a ritual of it, and then marched off to the barn with us in procession behind him. The clapper he'd kept muffled until the last, but when finally he, he pulled the first toll, the sound that it gave out took us all quite by surprise. It shocked us, in fact. It, it was a high, wide carrying note, and although it had a certain churchiness, there was something in it that was wild. It was almost scream-like, and that the long afternote sent a, a creeping chill up my spine. And then, when the last sinister tingle had faded out of the shaken air, Aunt Catherine spoke. Well, I'm certainly not going to have that thing rung for dinner. It would quite take away my appetite. And Uncle was not disposed to argue. Yeah. Huh. Well, if they rang that at curfew, they gave you fair warning. Now, we were to go back to school the next day, and... This was the thought that blotted out all others. It was important for us to, to get the most that we could out of the last afternoon. Towards sunset, we, we were still playing hide-and-seek in the garden. I, I was crouching in a, a deep clump of red dogwood, not far from the house, holding my breath and listening for the approach of Robert and John. I, I heard their, their voices drawing off in the wrong direction, and I, I was beginning to feel that I had time to straighten my stiff knees before they came back, and then to hope that they wouldn't be away too long. When with absolutely no other warning, a feeling of utter desolation and panic took hold of me. I felt I'd been deserted, exposed to unknown dangers, trapped. For no good reason, I turned round to look behind me and I saw two long-nailed, soily hands part the leaves and an evil face looked into my hiding place. The hair and cheeks were clotted with earth. The, the yellow teeth showed more on one side than the other. The, the eye sockets were appallingly hollow and it, it lifted its chin as the blind do when they seek. Well, I shot out of the bushes like a rabbit when the ferret looks in. I ran as hard as my legs would carry me to the house. I was shouting tearful nonsense. Now, my clamour soon brought Robert and John and Aunt Catherine, to whom I could give no better explanation than that I had seen a horrible face. Well, Auntie calmed me as, as best she could, saying it's probably just a tramp coming in to pick up some apples. And, and Uncle Tom, which he, he'd go round and send him off. And, and she and Uncle repeated that word, you know, as if it met the case perfectly. Some tramps, yeah, just a, a tramp. It was, it was the tramp, as if a casual word like that could cover such lurking horror. And then Uncle Tom, he did. He strode off looking very fierce. But he came back having seen nobody. Well, dusk had come by now. It was cold and the, the wind was rising and we, as may be imagined, had no further desire to play outside. So, after Aunt Catherine let us light the fire, 
and we persuaded her and uncle to stay with us and tell us ghost tales. I mean, the, the, the others, I think, out of pure love of sensation. And I, because it was the only way that I could get company for my thoughts and persuade the, the grown-ups to talk, however insincerely, on the same subject. The session opened with a, a little lecture from Aunt Catherine about the folly of the whole thing. Then the curtains were drawn and Uncle Tom began. And his personality and prestige greatly added to the effect of these stories because he, he was a tall and bony man and we held him in awe. He, he told tales about midnight coaches about grinning lift men who'd been seen in a dream the night before, about grey monks who'd passed people on the stairs and figures standing at midnight by one's bed. And you see, to me, all these spectres had the same face. The wind rose rapidly in accompaniment to his tales, and our feelings of horror were already outstripping the merits of Uncle's invention when a really terrible thing happened. A gust of wind tore open the casement and at the same time, the bell in the tower gave a jerky ring. Well, there was no need to tell us any more stories now. Our hearts were tight with fear as that terrible peal came and went with gusts of wind, even after the window was tightly closed again. And it, it was not like a bell rung on purpose, you see. It, it was like a bell evilly twitching of its own accord. Well, this is intolerable, said Catherine after a while. No one will sleep a wink tonight if that goes on. Well, don't worry, said Uncle with an irritated sigh. I'll go and take the clapper out, really. Nothing could be simpler. Now, come on, boys. You go off to bed. Well, we went up, keeping close together, and we clustered at our bedroom window to watch Uncle perform this act of bravery. He seemed to waste hours talking to aunt in the hallway while we waited upstairs and listened to that horrible vibrating shudder, the irregularity of which made it even more fraying to the nerves. The shadows under the yard walls were peopled for me with precise terrors, and so was the room at my back. The keyhole howled too, and the wind in the chimney buffeted hollowly. At last we saw Uncle Tom come out into the light from the back door and go down the yard. Then the shadow swallowed him up and we heard the barn door slam behind him. We fixed our eyes on the outline of the bell tower and again it seemed an age before we thought that we could just distinguish his head, shoulders and arms waving against the sky. There he is, said John in a whisper. Uncle had seized the bell and the clanging stopped. But a moment later, we heard him yell with the whole force of his great lungs and his body disappeared down the manhole. The bell stopped, but the wind still blew and it was hard to tell where sounds were coming from. Robert said that he thought he heard a dog fight going on somewhere. But Uncle Tom did not come back. I mean, time seemed too short now. We imagined how long it would be before he'd reappear, and then we doubled it, then we trebled it and began again. At last, Aunt Catherine came out and shouted for him, ran halfway down the yard and shouted again. The maid came out too, and presently the yard was full of people with lamps and flashlights shouting. They went into the barn after Aunt Catherine and came staggering out, carrying something towards the house. Well, we were seized with shame and undressed as quickly as we could, jumping into our beds. But Robert went on to the landing and called down the stairs to ask what had happened. Oh, go to bed, boys. And for the Lord's sake, keep quiet and keep out of the way, said a woman neighbour. Your uncle's had a nasty accident. And then we heard the horrible, mad, banshee sound of the maid having hysterics in the kitchen. <laughs>